beautiful. This morning, would you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts is in the New Testament, which is the second half of your Bible. If you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will hit Acts, Acts Romans. We're walking through the book of Acts as a church this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you or pew or whatever you want to call it. It'll it'll be there. So you can find one. (laughs) All right. Acts chapter 2. We have been, the very start here at the beginning, looking at how God is continuing the story of His church, establishing His work of redemption through calling people together in a community of believers to worship and glorify Him. And yet, as we worship on Sundays, you and I often live Monday to Saturday, and we see the problems that happen in the world around us. We know of the unhappiness that we experience We know of the depression and the anxiety that we battle. We know that the world is often filled with bitter and hateful people. We only have to turn on the news to see that these days. There are wars and rumors of wars. There is strife and all sorts of things wrong with the world. You and I as believers in Jesus Christ declare that those things come out of a wrong relationship with God. A sinful relationship that has been broken between you and I and God. So, we cling to the hope of the gospel. The hope that says there is light and darkness. There is possibility for love to penetrate hate. There is the possibility for the people that we think are unchangeable to be changed. But not by our might, but by the might of God. And so as we've turned to Acts, we looked in Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus has ascended into heaven and is reigning at the right hand of the Father. He is reigning and ruling and interceding on our behalf. Not only is Jesus reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father, but as we looked at last week at the end of chapter 1, the Father is working to redeem His people and establish His community that we call the church. Thankfully today, that vision is not complete. Not only is Jesus reigning and ruling at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf, not only is the Father working sovereignly to redeem His people and establish His community, but we have the Spirit who has come upon us to work in our lives as believers. And that is exactly what we see today in Acts chapter 2. There is an event called Pentecost. Now after the ascension of Jesus, Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming Spirit that He has promised to them. So they wait for 10 days. Jesus has died and resurrected, been on earth for 40 days, ascended into heaven. They wait for 10 more days, making a full 50 days. Hence the term Pentecost. It means the 50th uh, or the Feast of First Fruits. So there the disciples are waiting in Jerusalem. And something incredible happens. Now we want to read carefully today and follow what Scripture says. So read with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language. Parthians and Medes and Elimites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Fergan, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now let's just stop there for just a moment. We'll pick back up in Acts chapter 2 in just a second. So we see here at Pentecost... 
the Holy Spirit working to apply the work of Christ to believers. God has kept His promise. Aren't you glad that God always keeps His promises? He promised that He was going to send His Spirit, and He keeps that. And you and I, that is great news for us, because salvation has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. The Father sent His Son who accomplished the work on the cross and His Spirit calls us and applies that work to our life. It has everything to do with God from beginning to end. And we see God keeping His promise here at Pentecost to send His Spirit. Now there's a few things we need to clarify before we continue on. First of all, the median is not the message. Let me... Let me see if I can clarify what I mean by this, that the median is not the message. So oftentimes we get this story of Pentecost where flaming tongues come down from heaven and divided among the apostles. Now I believe with all my heart that every bit of scripture is true, and I believe that that actually happened. The question is, what happened here? Now when it talks about tongues in Acts chapter 2, and it talks about tongues in scripture, this is not gibberish. These are known tongues. Matter of fact, it tells us three times in verse 6, each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. In verse 7, they say, are these men not Galileans? Now, we may not get that reference, but Galileans were the rednecks of the day. They would kind of be like us saying, how is Uncle Si speaking perfect French? How is this happening? You know, that's, that's what they're asking. This does not make sense to have these guys speak their language and say, how are these rednecks speaking our language. They say it again in verse 8, each of us speaking our own language. Verse 11, are, are they not speaking our own tongues, the mighty works of God? And it lists all of these nations where they were. So they, this is not gibberish. These are known tongues. Which brings us back to the question, what language are we going to speak in heaven? Now I'll be honest with you, I hadn't been there, so I can't say this for sure. But it's my belief, based off of this, that we're going to speak all the languages in heaven. That's why I had Brother Marvin come and pray for us in Spanish today. I've got all eternity to learn what in the world he said. I, I heard my name at some point, but I'm going to find out one day. There's not just going to be English in heaven. Because God is God of more than just the United States. He is the God of the cosmos, of all people, of all tribes and tongues and nations. So this is not gibberish, these are known tongues. Not only is this not gibberish because they're known tongues, but he's also preaching a reasonable message, a logical message. Now we're going to read Peter's sermon in just a minute, the rest of Acts chapter 2. But what he preaches, he's preaching in those tongues to those people that are there so that they could know Jesus. It is a Christ-centered, expository sermon that focuses on Christ. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing the restoration of Babel. We're seeing the beginning of God beginning to bring us back together. You see, at Babel in, in Genesis, mankind came together and said, we're going to rebel against God's command to be fruitful and multiply and spread across the face of the earth. We're going to make our place in our time. God said, you want to do that? I'm going to make it so you can't understand each other. And he divided the languages. Here at Pentecost, we see the beginning of that change. Now, there is a little bit something different here. What I love about this, they didn't all speak one language. They spoke many languages. And what we see at the very beginning of the church here is unity and diversity. They didn't all speak English. They didn't all speak Spanish. They didn't all speak French. But they all knew of one Christ. Unity and diversity. So this event is unrepeatable. But what we see is that God's Spirit, the floodgates of God's Spirit, is now open to all believers. And it uses this language like filled and baptized and come upon. All of these words are used interchangeably. Now I want to I make sure that we clarify this as, as we look, as we dive into this this morning. Some people will look at those passages and see the words like filled and baptized and come upon. And they'll say things like this. Well, you can't really know that you're saved until you speak in tongues. Or you can't really know that you know Jesus until you have this sign or this work of the Spirit. Because you, ha you have to have this second feeling. That is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that to have Christ is to have the Spirit. 
all that the disciples can say about Pentecost was that they were there. That's it. They can't say that they were holy or special or or anything else. All they can say is that they were there. So God works His work in us. So what in the world does this mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's exactly what they asked. Verse 12. Some of you appreciate that, right? So verse 12. All of them were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Thank you, because we were wondering this morning. But others were mocking, mocking, saying that they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, verse 14, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. in the morning. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And so Peter clarifies what happens at Pentecost. This is that. He said, let this be known that this is what that was. He gives us this Christ-centered expository sermon. So what exactly is happening at Pentecost with the filling of the Spirit? Thank you, Peter, for telling us. Peter quotes Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. Here we have it in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams even on the male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and on the signs of the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the day of the Lord comes, the great and glorious or the great and magnificent day. Let's just stop right there. So Peter goes to the Old Testament to give them a Christ-centered expository sermon to show them this is that. This is what's taking place. And he tells us from Joel, in the last days it shall be. So you and I live in one age. Scripture speaks of this age. We live in this age. The time is now. But we're looking forward to the age to come when all things are put under the feet of Christ. However, you and I are living in the last days of this age. We're living in the last days of this age because Jesus has died and has risen and is sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting to come back one day. And so this is the time period known as the last days. Christ could come back at any time. Jesus' ascension from earth signaled that all the things that you and I know are temporary. And so we speak of God's kingdom as being now, but not yet. And so God's kingdom has broken into our world because of the finished work of Christ. So you see God's kingdom wherever the gospel is proclaimed. You see God's kingdom wherever Jesus is worshipped. You see God's kingdom wherever a life is transformed by the finished work of Christ. Yet, we still see people rebel against God. It is not yet. It is not full. But you and I are living in the last days of this age. As a part of that, verse 17, in the last days, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That God would make His presence known among us. Now in the Old Testament you have God's Spirit in certain people at certain times in certain places. So in Samson, we all know the story of Samson who got his hair cut off, right? Samson, what gave Samson his strength was not his hair. What gave Samson his strength was the Spirit of God. And as you read Samson's story, it says he did not realize that the Spirit of God had left him. We see in Moses, Moses as he's leading the Israelites in the Old Testament, Moses gets so tired because there's just so many people. And he tells us in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, he says, you know, I wish that God's Spirit would come upon everybody so that I did not have to guide them. Well, guess what, Moses? Jesus made it possible. Because now, because of the finished work of Christ, God's Spirit comes upon us. Now just think about this for a moment. How in the world is it possible for the presence of a holy God to dwell among a sinful people? You realize as you read the Old Testament, you had one person 
who could go one day of the year after doing all sorts of rites and rituals and sacrificing animals who could go before the presence of God and even then it was so tenuous they had to tie a rope around his leg in case he died. But now, you and I, a room full of sinful people, it is possible for us to be in the presence of God and to have God dwell with us and in us through His Spirit. God is moving to make His power known in the salvation of people. And it is only because of the finished work of Christ on the cross that you and I have any hope to be in the presence of God. It is not because of my righteousness. It is not because of my holiness. It is because of Christ's righteousness in me that has made the difference. And so now, the God who was once separated from me is close. So we are living in these days in which God's Spirit has been poured out at Pentecost and is poured out on all flesh. And so we are able to declare the Word of God boldly. Now, listen what happens here also in the last days. In verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and glorious day. The day of the Lord in Scripture is the judgment day. It is the day that Christ returns. It is the day that all the enemies of Christ are made a footstool to Him. It is the day when God sets all things right. And we get this amazing passage in timing. When the sun shall be turned to darkness in verse 20. I've been debating about what to mention to you about the eclipse tomorrow. (laughs) Because on one hand... I ought to warn you that if you go outside, you're going to go blind. But if I warn you that it's the apocalypse, it doesn't really matter. So just go ahead and stare. (laughs) So tomorrow is the great American eclipse. And there's a lot of questions about, is this the last days? Let me just remind you, Scripture. So Jesus has already told us in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it is not for us to know the times or the dates. That God has set. Jesus also tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that we're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and all sorts of disasters. These are but the beginning of birth pains. As we read this passage in verse 20, the sun shall be turned to darkness. When the great and glorious day comes, it won't just be a dark eclipse over the United States. It'll be God putting an end to the fusion of the stars. Because all things will be wrapped up in the twinkle of an eye. And the only thing that lasts is God. However, as we see events like tomorrow, they ought to remind us of the glory of God. You see, in Scripture, when you have things like earthquakes, God takes the most stable thing in your life, the ground, and shakes it upside down to remind you that He is God and you are not. When you see an eclipse tomorrow, you are reminded that the cosmos are greater than you and there is a God who controls it all. And He is not you. One day, Jesus is coming back. And that day will be the great and glorious day when the Lord will return. That day will be the day that every man and woman and boy and girl will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer for their life. And for sinners, that is a terrible day. That is a day of judgment and of wrath. There seems to be no hope. But thankfully for you and I, Peter does not end his sermon in verse 20. He continues on in verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, 
This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he goes on to quote two Psalms. So, the great and glorious day of the Lord is coming, but the Holy Spirit is working to apply the work of Christ. The Holy Spirit always magnifies Jesus so that believers can know Him and make Him known. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, verse 21, will be saved. So while salvation is a work of God from beginning to end, it is something that God the Father initiated. It is something that God the Son accomplished. It is something that the Spirit applies to us. Do not presume that you are saved. You and I are responsible to call upon Jesus and trust Him in faith. Because that is how we're saved. We're saved because of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit attests this. Jesus is our Savior, attested by God. He was crucified for our sins. But death could not hold Him. I love this passage right here where it says this. God, verse 24, God raised Him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for Him to be held by it. So catch what happens here. Jesus dies on the cross. And it's like death, this nasty, dark, disgusting monster swallowed the Son of God. It's a monster that everyone in this room will have to face. Every one of us will die one day. And as that monster swallowed Jesus, the perfect and spotless Lamb of God, the image that, that Peter gives us in Scripture is this. That death became pregnant with life. And all of a sudden, because death swallowed Jesus, death tried to hold it in, sort of like a pregnancy. That life was getting ready to give birth from death. And death did everything it could to hold on to Jesus. But it couldn't. And out of death burst forth life three days later. And Jesus made death a fallen enemy. So that now you and I who trust... Yeah, it's... It wasn't possible to hold. Death could not hold a sinless man. That would be unjust. So now that you and I who join in Christ, death no longer holds its sting. The grave no longer holds its victory. There will be a resurrection for you and I as well who believe in Jesus. So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. He continues on to say about David, brings in, brings in David in verse 29. David is dead. King David is dead at this day. He's buried. And we can go to his tomb. Verse 30. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Remember, he's continuing to explain Pentecost, that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding, acting, and ruling on our behalf. He tells us in verse 33, this Jesus who we tried to crucify, God has made Christ and Lord. Tells us, verse 36, So let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. There is a two edged sword as we present the gospel. In one instance, we want to present it in an inviting way. I want to tell you this morning if you are not a believer, maybe you're a skeptic, maybe you don't trust God. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus died for your sins so that you can be forgiven. So that you can have a relationship with God. I want to tell you this morning that God is calling all His lost sheep to Himself. But on the other side, as I do that, I want to be very careful as well. God is not a needy God that He needs you. God is sovereign and complete on His own. 
And so while we worship Jesus and he's made it possible for you to come come to him, he is Lord and Christ. And so scripture has no concept of a carnal Christian, of someone who says, yeah, I know Jesus because I want to go to heaven, but then lives the way that they want to live. Scripture has no concept of that phrase that we use in our invitations to make Jesus Lord. Listen, you can live in God's world, you can be hostile, you can rebel, but you can't diminish His power. No matter what you do, God is always Lord. Whether you rebel or worship Him, He is Lord. This is exactly what we see the Spirit doing. The Spirit always exalts Christ. So back to Pentecost, this is Peter's Pentecost sermon. What does Peter do in the power of the Spirit but exalt Jesus? So let's get a little practical here for a moment. We want to talk about a Spirit-filled church. We want a Spirit-filled church. What does that look like? For some of you, you would say it's duty. It's tradition. We get up and we get dressed and we come to church because it's Sunday and we're here and we're studying the Bible. And your idea of a Spirit-filled church is the fact that this is what you do on Sundays. You get up, you get dressed, you go to church, you talk about God, and then you go home. Let me tell you this morning. It is completely possible to be a well-taught, moral sinner bound for hell. On the other end of that, some people say a spirit-filled church is the church that has the fog machines and the lights and the, uh, has the, the, gl- the blaring music and it's exciting and it's ready to go. If I can convince Brother Jim to wear skinny jeans, You see, some people have gotten tired of the duty and the tradition. They said, that's, that's boring. We need more livelihood. But don't mistake livelihood for life. You see, it's not the median. It's the message. And a spirit-filled church is not about the median. It's about the message. A spirit-filled church is the church that glorifies Jesus as Lord and Christ. And so if you want a spirit-filled church, it's not about the skinny jeans, it's not about the tradition, it's about Jesus. That's what a spirit-filled church looks like. What about a spirit-filled home? If you want a spirit-filled home, what does that look like? Now I tell you as a father, there's one thing I'm really good at, and that's putting my foot down. All right? Katie, unfortunately, makes me do all that. (laughs) You need to lay the foot down to your children. Okay. With my kids, raising them, I can give them the law all day long. And all I've made is well-respected children who are bound for hell. But if I want to have a spirit-filled house, I have to give my kids more than rules. I have to give them the gospel of Jesus. Because I can't change their hearts. But God can. Our oldest daughter is a believer in Jesus, and we're praying for the next two. I can't wait to the day I get to take them up there. But a spirit-filled home is more than just about the rules. It's about Jesus. I'm going to pick on guys because I are one. <laughs> guys, if you want to be a spirit, if you want a spirit-filled house in your home, you want to be the spiritual leader in your home, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. God commands us to love our wives the same way that Christ loved the church. Ephesians 5, you can look it up. <laughs> Jesus died for the church. You want a spirit-filled home? You start loving your wife the way that Christ loves you. And you make much of Jesus. That's how your home is filled with the Spirit. What about a spirit-filled person? We talked about spirit-filled church and spirit-filled home. What about a spirit-filled 
person. If you want to be a person full of the Spirit, then you magnify Jesus, not yourself. You magnify God, you glorify God, not your opinions, not your rights, not your ideas. You magnify Jesus. And that begins with a relationship with Him, bowing to Him as Lord in Christ. You see, Spirit-filled people make much of Jesus. Jesus Himself says this in John chapter 15, verse 26, that He is going to send the Spirit, and the Spirit will bear witness to Him. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, that no one says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. John adds to this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, and says that no one declares that Jesus has come in the flesh except by the Spirit. So if we want to experience what they experienced, if we want to know what it's like to be full of the Spirit, we must know that the Spirit always magnifies Jesus. So today, we have some people in here that don't know him. Let me finish out this long passage that we've been reading today. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your, yourself and, and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. If you don't know Jesus, today is the day to repent, to turn around, to change your mind, to worship Him, to make much of Him. Salvation is the work of God from beginning to end. But God is calling you to receive Christ and trust Him. For believers, you and I are to bear witness to Christ. Let me remind you, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses when the Spirit comes upon you. And that's exactly what we see happen here at Pentecost. In verse 40, with many other words, He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received the word were baptized and were added to their number, 3,000 souls. If you're not a believer, today's the day to repent and trust Christ. If you are a believer, we want to be a Spirit-filled church. We want Spirit-filled houses. We want Spirit-filled people. And the way to do that is to make much of Jesus. Let us resolve today to worship Him and Him alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word.